Good morning. Welcome to worship. Um, and here we are to worship. Hey, uh, y'all take the time. Take a couple minutes. Get up. Greet your neighbor. Shake some hands and then we're going to get started.
Okay, it's time for you extroverts to take a seat. Once again, welcome to worship. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We've got a few announcements. Uh, please look at your bulletins, uh, your prayer list. Uh, keep those folks on your on, on your thoughts and prayers. Um, birthdays, there's a few birthdays over here. Uh, Women on the Mission, lunch and meeting on May 21st following worship. That is today, y'all. Uh, Miss Janice, schedule. Classrooms. classrooms, not fellowship halls. Be in the classrooms. Um, backpack Buddies, we're always uh, looking for donations for the Backpack Buddies. Uh, as you know, that uh, may be their only meal the whole weekend, so uh, always good to, to, to donate to that. Mount Pisgah Lunch Bunch is meeting um, Sunday, May 28th. Bring somebody who hasn't been here. Buy them lunch. Bring them out to Paradise. We'll call it Pisgah Paradise. <laughs> Why not? Why not, right? Why not? I don't, I'm sure they won't mind the name change. Um, we also have uh, a baccalaureate service coming June the 4th. Uh, call the church office. If you have graduates that are graduating, they'll, they can walk the aisle, get celebrated. Uh, they'll, you know, we put their names on a list. We, well, there's also awesome cards and, and accolades that go with it. So if you got graduates coming, sign them up. Let's get them on the list, okay? Uh, and also, lastly, uh, the service for Anna McLean will be Tuesday, May 23rd. Visitation will be at 10 a.m. in the fellowship hall. Not in here, fellowship hall, and then uh, the service following at 11 a.m. Did I miss anything? If I could, I'd like to um, backpack on the Backpack Buddies. Uh, Miss Walfall is the, our point of contact at Alderman Elementary School, and she did make the comment that she anticipates next year if we can, to be able to do 58 backpacks a week. What? That's up from 40. Um, we've, we've never had a problem so far doing 40, but if you see it in your heart that we can continue to support that program, she anticipates as many as 58 families next year. So keep that in your hearts. Thank you. Good morning. It is great to see you all this morning. And I, I want to share with you something, just a story that kind of comes to mind. There are teachers in our own school system, and they, they will tell you that when kids go home for the weekend, the first thing they have to do when they get back on campus on Sunday, on Monday morning, is they have to go weigh them. They weigh them when they leave on Friday, and then they weigh them when they come home on come to church and school on Monday because they're not getting food. And you may say, well, you know, their parents have got to do better. Well, sometimes parents can. And there are some parents that don't understand and there are some parents that are intertwined in addiction that, that just don't care. They don't have the ability to care. Those are the kids that God has placed before us and said, these are the these are ones. These are my least of these for you to serve. And so I am so grateful for what you do. And you know what I know? I know we'll meet that day. Because that's who you are as a church. And that brings a moment of salvation to a kid. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Salvation. What does it truly mean? We're going to mention that this morning. But I invite you to join me as we pray together our invitation. Will you join me as we pray? Father, this morning we come to you. Some of us have accepted your gift. And some of us still are questioning and wondering. But God, this morning may we all know that this moment that we are together is a moment of salvation. A moment of your grace that we have risen, have risen this morning to breathe new life. A new day. A new day to see the sun and a new day to be with those that we love. So God, we are grateful. 
And we sit here this morning grateful. But Father, may we understand this message, this doctrine of salvation more deeply. And may we, at every moment in our lives, not know that we are saved, but understand what that salvation truly is. So God, we are grateful to be here this morning. Grateful that you have brought us together to experience your love with each other. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. This morning together there are no words. There is simply prayer as we confess ourselves to God. I invite you to open this time of confession between you and God to confess yourself. Not only your sins, but confess where you have truly seen God this week. Confess where you have seen the celebration of life that is lived out through His grace because of that moment. Pray where you have seen the presence of God that is ministered to one of the least of these. Pray where you have seen or heard the presence of God as you have seen a friend or a family member or had a conversation with them this week. 
confess to God where you felt he wasn't there and ask him to show you where he has never left. Take this moment in silence to pray to God and then we will join together. Let us join our hearts as we pray together. Lord, you know us too well. You know how loudly proclaim your faith when all is going well. But when the waters get rough and the waves threaten to swamp our little boats, we cry and wail in fear. Over the wind and the waves, you call to us to place our trust in you. That's not so easy for us. Forgive us. Help us to hear your call to us to get out of the comfort of our boats. Help us to hear the cries of those around us who are overwhelmed by their ways and to reach out in grace. Forgive us. Transform us. Let us abide in your peace. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we know that there are those in this world, but that's too general, oh God. We know there are those who you've placed in our lives that simply cannot see you. Maybe their life is too reaped with crisis and pain. Or maybe there is a moment that they do not understand. But God, while we who stand outside see and know that you are there, that you have never left them, may we show grace and compassion and not condemnation. May we give them an ear to share and show their lament. And may we simply share with them your love and your compassion. May we be willing to share with them a moment. A moment more than just thoughts <coughs> and prayers, but a moment of Christian love. A love that is not bathed in because we have to, but a love that is bathed in because we are. Because that is who we have become over our lifetime as you have transformed us to be your child. Father, too often we stand outside and we bring judgment and we force you into the picture when that seems to be the last thing they want. So God, may we realize that a moment and a presence given in love is you. 
that you are not a word to be spoken, but you are an action to be shared. May we, O oh God, share the same salvation that you brought us to. And this morning, O oh God, for each of us, wherever we are, we pray together. And we know that we experience your love both as individuals and, both I and as a family. And may as we pray your eternal prayer, we know that you are always with us and will never forsake us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
morning. It is so good to see you all this morning. Um, as the as our friends come forward and go to their special time, we are excited to see them this morning. As well as so many of you, um, it has been an exciting week. Um, uh, from dance competitions to softball games to baseball games, it's it's all going on right now. And um, and you know the group that came to watch Bailey play, I'm. I'm th I thank you for coming, um, but uh, I'm glad you got to experience that with us. That's family. That's experience. So not only do y'all have softball games to go to, y'all got some dance competitions to go to. You got some other baseball games to see. Ain't that right, Braden? <laughs> and uh, experience. Experience with them. Another act of salvation. So maybe you have an idea where we're going this morning. Will you join with me? I'm going to read uh, from the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 31 through 34. They said to Paul, put your entire trust in the Master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live and everyone in your house included. And they went to spell out in detail the story of the master, and the entire family got in on this part. They never did get to bed that night. The jailer made them feel at home, dressed their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning, was baptized, he and everyone in his family. There in his home, he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on the celebration. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a teenager, I had an experience. And as I've reflected on it over my life, the more disgusted I have taken that experience. When I was eight years old, I made a profession of faith that the church that I attended in Lake City, Tennessee, First Baptist Church, took some time. It was kind of funny because my sister had been baptized and she commented how cold the water was because the heater wasn't working in the baptismal pool that Sunday night. And I said, Dad Gummit, I'm waiting until the summer because the water will be warmer. <laughs> that wasn't my negative experience. Because I remember when my sister walked forward. I, I remember when she made that profession of faith and how Aunt Nett, and I think I've shared with you some, and you all have an Aunt Nett here, somebody who has loved children and ministered and cared for them throughout the years, and everybody kind of looks to her or an Uncle Net, maybe, that looks to them and remembers them with fondness. And we, in Lake City, especially a lot of folks that I went to school with, we talk about Jeanette Galloway as a saint. And she was there holding hands with my mom and several other friends and church family members, and they were crying because my sister had made a profession of faith. And I remember my time too on a Sunday night and the pastor is preaching who was Ron Clay at the time. And Ron said, the altar's open for you. And there I came walking, shaking, sitting in the side of a pew, walking down that aisle. 
I knew it meant that I was going to go to heaven, but I didn't know fully what it meant. I don't think we're really supposed to. And it, it, it's okay. Because part of what I know about that experience now is that it's a continuation of growth. But you remember, if you listened to my words, I said an experience as a teenager. Eight years old is not a teenager. My experience of salvation was good. I went to an evangelistic revival in Lake City. And the preacher got up and proclaimed this message which was emotionally driven. Almost, well no, very much to the point that me and a group of my friends who were sitting up high at a football stadium in Lake City, Tennessee, yes, in Tennessee, those are holy places. as he proclaimed on a flatbed truck, trailer, you need to get saved. And me and my friends walked down those steps and walked out onto that football field and knelt in tears. And he said, you're saved and you know it. And I remember at that moment in time, that I went, duh. I made a profession of faith at eight years old. I need you to help me understand why I'm here. Why, why here? Why now? I didn't walk forward to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've already done that. But there was something in that message that touched my heart. that brought me to some place where I am now. It wasn't a positive experience. It didn't restore my faith, and I must admit, it didn't restore my faith in these tent revivals and pop-up revivals. It just didn't. Those kind of things affect us our entire lives. And throughout my life, one of the things that has been in me is to understand what my salvation means beyond just you get to go to heaven. Because I can tell you without a doubt it is so much more than that it's not a moment when you sit and go and walk forward and profess your faith with God that is not a climactic moment that is a beginning step to set and discover and understand what does God's kingdom look like what is the beauty on this earth that we share with all these people that look like us? What does it mean to truly know and experience and live in God's salvation? Even when we experience some really, really bad stuff from time to time. When we have questions, when somebody's healed and we pray for the healing of our loved one and they pass away and we ask the question, why? We ask the question, if God is so kind and loving, why do people suffer in this world 
Why is it there are times when we truly feel God has left us, that He's not there? Sometimes in our darkest moments. Just be honest with yourself. We've all had moments. God's grace brought us here today because in spite of those moments, we know that God is with us. We proclaim it. We come today because I'm going to remind you of the promise so long ago. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You remember that? That's true. Because understanding and knowing God's salvation is not in spite of those events. It's what carries us through those events of deep and grief and pain. And it's not just a spirit that we know. It is those who have also professed and understand God's salvation to mean that it is my part. It is who I am created to be, to be in the life of those that I love and share this world with and bring them comfort in moments of their greatest need. And my gosh, how this community of faith does that. You're just there. You understand presence in a way that I have never seen lived out as a whole in a community of faith. Allow me to describe that because you may not even realize that you do that. To simply sit with someone and be there. Not feeling as you have to say a word or say all of these empty phrases You're simply there. Whether sitting in presence or sitting and touching or giving a hug or bringing banana pudding or broccoli salad or barbecue. (coughs) Y'all got hungry again, I know. But you share love in so many different ways. You share it with people who are not even present in this room. Children at an elementary school that you do not know. And you don't share that food with the expectation that, hey, it's going to make our church grow. Maybe they'll come to our church. You do it because that's who you are. And that's what Christ asks us to be. And all of those moments are salvation. That is is our salvation. Living the presence of God, the presence of Christ in this world with love and hope. Reminding us that in our darkest moments, Christ is there. In our greatest celebrations, Christ is there. Coming to worship together, Christ is there. Sharing eggs as people leave the sanctuary, Christ is there. You share it. No questions asked. I haven't heard one person ask about backpack buddies. Well, where's that money going to come from? It's always there. It's always there. Where's the help going to come from? It's there. That's salvation. Sadly, too many people look at salvation as this set of rules that we expect people to live by. And they sit and judge and say, well, this is the world that I see that it needs to be. And they point at them and say, you're not living it. So until you live it, you can't be a part of me. Until you live the way that I think you should live, 
You can't come to our church. You can't participate. We deny them salvation. And salvation in and of itself is not set in stone. It's something that has been discussed and debated for generations. Hundreds of years. From penile substitutionary atonement, which may not mean anything to you. Ransom theory of atonement. To moral influence theory of atonement. What does all that mean? Well... Jesus had to pay a price to Satan in order to save your soul. Well, that doesn't really quite fully make sense, does it? Because why would Jesus owe Satan anything, right? And then we have another theory of atonement that said Jesus gave himself on his life to pay his price to God. So to some people, that doesn't truly sound good because why would God kill his own son that was perfect when all he has to do is pronounce, I give you grace and forgiveness. So somebody said, well, let's figure out another way. And they've said and debated it and <coughs> gone it and moral influence that Christ came and showed us a way to fully live. I have to admit, that's the one I tilt to. You've heard me talk about it. That in Christ's sacrifice, he showed us fully how to live. That we must be willing to sacrifice ourselves for each other. That's what he placed us on this earth to do. Death may not be the only reason and only way, but he brought us here to show him to fully and completely love. But there are problems with that. I'm not going to tell you it's perfect. But the reality is, is that salvation begins with one thing. We've said it a thousand times, haven't we? Love. However, in whichever theory you tend to purport to and tend to believe in, it's all about love and it brings love and it shows love and it shows care and it shows compassion and it shows grace and it's absent of judgment. It is not a clanging gong or a clanking cymbal, is it? It is the greatest of things. And it's not full and it's not complete and will we, never, we will never fully see it here on this earth because there are moments when we see such great tyranny and such great evil. But we as Christians can continue to show love in the face of that pain and that anger. We continue to reach out to our brothers and sisters, both those that live in Christ and both those in, hum and in humanity. And we can show them love in the presence of pain and anguish. Because we have hope. We have hope. Because if you truly want to see salvation, it is a moment-by-moment moment thing where you truly look to see where God is. And you see that presence. And as you see it, the more you see it, the more you want it, and the more you crave it, and the more you will draw to it. And there'll be moments when you won't even have to say it because much like Moses when he walked up on the mountain and he came down, you will be aglow. People will look at you and say, hey, there's something different there. People will know. They will see. It takes more time than others for some. But that is salvation. And if that's not what we are looking for, if that's not what we see and that's not what we understand of salvation, what we may have found is an empowerment to bully, to keep people away.
there are communities in this world, ancient, that just went out and said, hey, come be a part of us. Come live with us. And there are those that say, stay here. When you meet our qualifications, you can come. There's an old story. I've probably shared it before. I'll share it again. <coughs> a monk in a monastery is taking a walk one day out of his community of faith, and he's going to see an old friend, a Jewish hermit rabbi that lives in the woods apart from everybody, spending his life in meditation and prayer. The brother goes into his tent and they begin to have a discussion as he bemoans the fate of his community. They're down to seven brothers that are living in the community and they're dying off and aging rapidly and truly they can't stand to be around each other. He bemoans that fact. What is going on among us that no one will want to come and be a part? Brother Theodore says. And the rabbi looks at him and says, What do you mean? He said, I can't see anything good. He said, Brother Cleopas is just old and crotchety. Doesn't seem to like everybody, and when somebody doesn't meet what he wants, he just chastises them in a moment's notice. Then there's Brother John. Well, he's the youngest among us, and being so young, he's kind of wild and free and not very disciplined. Can't stand it. He never cleans up from dinner. Never on time where he needs to be when we have our prayers and community time and we get so frustrated with him. And then there's, there's Brother James. Brother James simply doesn't interact with anybody. Stays in his room most of the time and just hates life. And then Brother Luke, he, uh, he just hates everybody. Brother Matthew, why is he hugging everybody all the time? I can't stand to be touched, and he's hugging me, and it frustrates me. And the rabbi said, it's interesting. He said, you said you could not see anything good. What about God? The bad stuff has so overcome me, I can't even see God. Wow. He said, while I am not of the Christian faith and knowing the belief you place in Jesus, even on all this, it comes to me that I should tell you that Christ is among you. Maybe look for that. Christ is among you. He said, I, I don't know. He said, I don't know. And so they sat and they cried and they bemoaned and they prayed. And then Brother Theodore went back to that abbey. And he walked into the abbey and on his mind was, Christ is among us. Where, where is Christ? And over the next month before he went back to see his friend, the rabbi, he sat and he looked at them. And he, he began to look at the brothers differently. He began to see some transformation in them. He, he saw in the brother that would just get frustrated he said, hey, why do you always get frustrated? 
He said, because there is discipline in Christ. And he would tell him, maybe look at something different. And he would look at Brother John and he would say, why are you always not on time? He would say, it's not important. And he looked at Brother John and he said, maybe look outside of yourself to look to the other brother." And one by one, he talked with them about the things that frustrated him. And he began to see them in a different light. And he brought them together and he shared with them the wisdom of the rabbi. And told them, Christ is among them. And they began to sit and talk. Be honest about the things that frustrated them and begin to hear reasons why and understanding of each personality and how they all began to see that this was not bad but it was a personality that brought something good to each of them a need for discipline a need to live life wildly and without abandon. Or excuse me, with abandon. To live life holding those that they love to accountability. To live a life that was immense with love and touch. And they began to look each with each other as if they were looking and seeing Christ. And as they did that, their community grew. Because they began to realize that it wasn't just a spirit that was among them. It was a spirit that lived in each of them. And each distinct and different personality they began to see Christ and they fully began to love each other for who they are. That spirit and breath lives in each one in this room and each one that is created by God. Our salvation rests and not that we chose Christ but that Christ chose us now let's live that out for the world amen amen let's pray Father, there is no other word that we can say this day except that we are grateful your Son, Jesus Christ, is with us. Amen. I invite you to sing with us our closing hymn. It's another, I said this is an amazing grace day because all of these songs are songs that these different generations will know and they just forget looking at the words and they sing them by heart. But let's stand and sing a closer, just a closer walk with thee. Um, if I could, um, before we start, there's somebody that I know we all take for granted in this church. He doesn't care for recognition, but there's somebody that is always here before everybody shows up and most of the time after everybody leaves. He's faithful at, at, at the calling that God has asked him to do for this church, not only for Sundays, but for services of loved ones that have passed um, and, and just things like that. And I, and I know that I take him for granted and I don't thank him enough for what he does. And I hope that, that you all would 
occasionally thank Shane for what he does for this church because he is so faithful at, at, at doing what God has called him to do. So every now and again, just pat him on the back and thank him for all he does for this church. Today, as it continues on, I hope you've had a great week. I hope you have a better week than you had this week. For if you do...